The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... We got two choices. We either get comfortable having a bad conscience so bad things don't bother us anymore, or we change and try and do the right things. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Everlasting Gospel video series. This morning I'd like to talk to you about uh, a message I thought something important to think about at the beginning of a new year. And it's the subject of your conscience. And more specifically, the care and the feeding of your conscience. I couldn't find a photograph of a conscience, so I used a brain. That was the closest thing I could find. If you have one of the conscience, you could email me. I'd like to use that. The Bible tells us that God is inviting us to live before Him with a clear and a pure conscience. Jesus came to save us from guilt, and He came to save us from one of the side effects of guilt, which is a guilty conscience. He wants us to live before Him with a pure conscience. And before I dive very deep in this message, I think it's a good time to get a definition. Conscience. The word conscience uh, actually comes from the combining, this is how I learned to spell it, of con-science. Science means knowledge or the study of, and it's a knowledge or understanding of the study of yourself and what your values are. Dictionary definition is a motivation deriving logically from ethical or moral principles that govern a person's thoughts and actions. B, conscience is conformity to one's own sense of right conduct. That's a simple definition I like. C, a feeling of shame when you do something immoral. D, the awareness of a moral or ethical aspect to one's conduct together with the urge to prefer right over wrong. E, the part of our mind that judges the ethical nature of one's actions and thoughts and then processes such determinations for consideration. Uh, I was uh, looking with my son Stephen last night. We were going through the internet. It's a bunch of dictionaries and thesauruses and encyclopedias. You would not believe how much there is on just trying to define what is the conscience. What is this inner voice in people that governs them that you can't find with a scalpel? But it's there, isn't it? It's this, this guiding voice, this urge. Now, to some extent, you have to listen carefully to everything I'm going to say. We all come factory equipped with an element of conscience, to some extent. It is standard equipment. I'm telling you that being raised basically an atheist. I had a sense, as far back as I can remember, that certain things were just wrong and just right, and I don't remember when anyone along the way taught me. Matter of fact, indeed, the examples I had were contrary in my life with my parents, but I knew some things were wrong, and I knew some things were right. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but my mother would take me out shoplifting, and she'd say, oh, they got plenty of money, they charged too much, and she would justify and rationalize it. Never saw her get caught. My father, and you wonder how I ended up a thief, right? My father, millions of dollars. I watched him once engage in petty theft more than once. And he laughed and thought, ha ha, I got away with something. And so I did not have that kind of example. But you know what? I always knew it was wrong. I knew lying was wrong. And yet my mother would tell me, to be a good actor, Doug, my mother was an actor, actress, she'd say, you've got to be a good liar. <laughs> That's an interesting philosophy because you're trying to purportedly be something or s somebody you're not. And so I wasn't raised with the appropriate morals. But I always had an inner voice that said, this is right and this is wrong. The Holy Spirit does speak to even pagans. The Holy Spirit is what we need to guide us. John chapter 16, verse 13, 
However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. You know, a conscience is something like a thermostat in your house, but it must be adjusted. And it must be the Holy Spirit that adjusts that thermostat. Now, how many of us would like to have a clear conscience? Would like to have a clear conscience? Would you like a really clear conscience or would you like to just think you've got a clear conscience? Is there a difference? Are there people who are guilty that think they've got a clear conscience? Well, I, I want a really clear conscience. The wicked do not have real peace. You can read in the Bible, Isaiah 57, verse 21. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor Doug, I mean, you know, there are people like Saddam Hussein and others who might be guilty of mass murder and they seem to sleep at night. We've heard about serial killers that they can look coldly into the camera and just smile and act like they have no problem at all. Cold-blooded, conscience seared with a hot iron. But in most cases, the wicked know that they're wicked and they tremble and it bothers them. The most dangerous thing is when you don't have any compunctions. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8, Paul says, Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. You notice that having a good conscience is something that is ongoing. It represents an ongoing desire to live honorably. Somebody said one time, a bad conscience embitters the sweetest comforts. A good conscience sweetens the bitterest crosses. It's like uh, Heather Tallchief. Doesn't matter if you've got a million dollars and a guilty conscience. Proverbs many times talks about how much better it is to have a handful with peace than a house full of treasure with strife. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now listen to this. Who is the Helper? Holy Spirit. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction. You know, there's been a lot of talk in our culture, and I think some of it's from the devil, not to feel guilty about anything. Um, Freud sort of had that at his foundation, that all guilt is learned, and you shouldn't feel guilt. And we need a guilt is what's bad, and guilt is what makes people sick. And there may be some truth to guilt making people sick, but guilt is a good thing if you're guilty. How many are not wanting to feel guilty when they are guilty? And this is what society and kind of the psychobabble of the day is. It, they're all trying to make everybody feel good about being bad. Where God is saying, no, you should feel bad if you are bad. What do you do if you've got a child that is a kleptomaniac and has no guilt about it? Would that worry you? I mean, don't you want your children to have a conscience of what is right and wrong? And yet, we're being told over and over in our culture, we're being trained by the devil to think that bad is good and good is bad. And it's very dangerous when it gets to that place. On the subject of conscience, the Bible talks about a pure conscience. Does your conscience bother you? You know, you want to keep your conscience sensitive. You don't want to get to the place where you don't have that feeling of guilt when you've done something wrong. And you know what's dangerous is when we, when we get to the place where we say, oh, it's just a little thing, and the little things don't bother us. We want to have a conscience that is pure. Somebody said a good conscience makes a soft pillow, makes it easier to sleep at night. Paul said, and this is the verse I especially want you to underline, Acts 24, verse 16 and herein do I exercise myself to have always... What does exercise mean? Is exercise laying down or is it active? He says, I'm actively always working to have a conscience void of offense towards God in men. There are offenses towards God and there are offenses towards men. Borrowed my neighbor's laugh.